My name is Edwin May. Uh, I'm a physicist. I was awarded a PhD in 1968 in experimental low energy nuclear physics. And at that time, I had never heard of extrasensory perception. I had a postdoctoral assignment at the University of California in Davis, and I ran into an individual who said, why don't you come to this meeting? We're talking about something called extrasensory perception. I said, what's that? He said, come to the meeting and find out. Uh, long story short, I ran into a well-known psychic, the late Ingo Swan, and he was able to secure a position for me at Stanford Research Institute in Menlo Park, California, and I joined them in 1975 as a consultant, and later as a research physicist, and later as the director of the project. So that's how it all began. Okay. Well, most skeptics would say that psychic abilities are just random effects. Now, what's your experience? There, um, the question is whether or not ESP is real. That's a, a, pre a question that has been bothering those of us in the research field for a very long period of time. And the answer is fairly complex. If you look at just the statistics, the weak statistics of, of extrasensory perception experiments, there's valid arguments on all sides of that. But I would like to quote Professor Jessica Utz. She was president of the American uh, Statistical Association. And in her presidential address to that top of the line organization, she said, this stuff meets all the requirements that you would apply to every other discipline as being a genuine phenomenon. Uh, that's one aspect of whether ESP is real or not. Another one is, can you use it for anything productive? Yeah, and can you? Our program, uh, which was called Stargate uh, at Stanford Research Institute uh, and later at Science Applications International, the whole reason for its existence was to use it for spying on the Soviet Union, East Bloc, and China. Uh, we survived for 23 years at a total budget of uh, nearly $20 million. That would not have happened if it weren't producing something that was in fact useful and real. Let me give you an example of a kind of uh, tasking that we would have from the government. I'll give you two. Uh, one, um, the National Security Council, which is the advisory arm for the President of the United States, uh, they had noticed by other means that there was a building in Sverdlovsk, former Soviet Union, now Russia. That place had been known since the 40s as a submarine construction place. but. The satellites were looking in at the windows of a large, large building, and they knew something huge was going on in there, but they had no idea. So what did they do? They sent us a photograph, satellite photograph, of the roof of the building. That was placed in a completely opaque envelope. That envelope was placed in a larger opaque envelope and handed to someone who had no idea what was in it or where it came from. That envelope was placed before Mr. Joseph McMonagall, one of our chief psychics, and said, the problem of the day is in this envelope. That sounds awful magical to me, but it works. And what Mr. McMonagall uh, described in a 137-page transcript, on and on and on, about the construction of a very, very large submarine that had two hulls, like a catamaran, and an outside skin, uh, it, it dwarfed a World War II submarine, and it had a, a propulsion system that would be undetectable. And it turned out, and I think it's uh, September 23rd, 1980, they launched what in the West is called the Typhoon-class submarine, which is exactly like that, double-hulled and everything. And the Russians call it the Akura, the shark. And from the West point of view during the Cold War, that boat was terrifying because it was completely and utterly silent. A second example, uh, more close to home, uh, the uh, Drug Enforcement Agency. They had um, uh, an agent who went bad and was selling drugs, with the, was dealing with drugs with the bad people. And he got found out and fled. And the whole nation, there was a nationwide uh, manhunt for this fellow, knowing that he was uh, like to sailboats and so on. So all the attention was along the coast because he must be there and he's a sailor. And one of our people that we work with is a, a woman named Angela Ford, 
who had a 37-year career as a defense analyst and really excellent at that job, and a minor portion of that was spent as a remote viewer. She basically uh, stuck a pin in a map, metaphorically at least, and said, oh, he's in Wyoming, south of Yellowstone National Park and an Indian graveyard and so on. Based on that information, they went and captured him. But how accurate in detail is it? Could you always rely on the perceived information? One of the problems when you have a human-based observation, whether it's traditional spying in World War, uh, like in World War II, or our version of it using psychics, humans are notoriously bad at that, that job uh, because they, have, uh, they woke up on the wrong side of the bed or they had some problem with their spouses and fighting or what have you, or just poor observations. You're counting tanks through field glasses and you miscount by a, by a large sum. The good news is that our version of that using psychics is as good as traditional gathering of information by normal, by World War II like spies. It's equally as bad. And the issue is you should never use that kind of intelligence as a sole source of information to do anything. Where our value came was as tip-offs for other more traditional means of gathering intelligence and that was immensely uh, productive. So, how many psychics did you have in your staff at that time? Our program did not have very many at all. We had, in terms of the number of psychics working, uh, a total of about 25, but never all at once. There'd be three or four, some would leave, some would come on board. And that's to be contrasted with what the Soviet Union was doing in that era. They had 120, nearly 10 times as many people, full time. Uh, it, wasn't clear that that helped them any, but uh, ours were professional. They are almost, in fact, none of them would meet a stereotypic what you think a psychic should be like. Did you use to cross-check or uh, compare information from the different psychics? One idea that uh, most people are interested in is wouldn't you have more than one psychic on, on a particular task? Well, that doesn't work very well. Let me give you an example. Suppose you have a perfectly dark room in fact, a well-light well room, and you have three people standing outside. And you say, okay, go into this room, look around, gather anything you can about this room, leave, put in a second person, a third person, and compare notes. Turns out that that is not a very reliable way to find out that there's a kangaroo in the corner. <laughs> the thing you're really interested in, everybody will miss. And it's just like the other form of human observation. Remote viewing is not necessarily enhanced by having more people with the same kinds of problems. So we rarely used, in fact, I think in the operational work spying, we never used multiple people. Um, does everyone, to some degree, have the ability to develop a talent for ESP? When researchers are dealing with any human talent, I don't care what that talent is, playing a violin, running 100 meters, swimming, whatever. There's a wide variation of skill that you find in the population at large. For example, in my case, uh, I could not compete in the Olympics for high jumping. I can jump 30 centimeters in the air, <laughs> not two meters. And all the training in the world will not allow me to do that. So in any kind of skill, there's kind of a natural uh, ability for that skill and remote viewing and ESP is not separate from that. So our estimate at this stage is that roughly 1% of, of, of selected populations have a skill level that's good enough to meet laboratory standards. Now it's been pointed out to me that because we had selected populations, we don't have an idea in the broad population, you know, just grabbing people off the street. But I think it's not a bad approximation. So not everybody has some minor skill, for sure. Like I can play the noise on a violin that would clear out a room in no time, but I'm not, I will never become a Yasha Heifetz or some of the most famous violinists around. And so why would you not expect the same thing with, with psychic functioning? But have you been able to detect any differences in the brain of people who have these abilities? Not, we have not been able to detect, with this variation, we've not been able to detect variations in the brain, not for lack of looking at it. Uh, the neuroscience work we are about to engage in will not look at people while they are being psychic, and there's a special reason why we won't do that. But our, we have an idea about 
brain structure, brain anatomy, that would favor somebody being psychic or not. And so we have a handful of psychics we have calibrated, and a handful of other people we have calibrated that can't be psychic under laboratory conditions. And we'll say, okay, to the neuroscientists, why don't you develop a hypothesis based on the two different structures, and then we'll use people you won't know whether they're good, bad, or indifferent, and see whether it works. If it works, it'll be a, a major breakthrough. Have you been able to detect the information carrier or any kind of a carrier wave on which this information is transmitted? One of the big problems facing scientists today is what is the mechanism? How does the information get from point A to point B, especially if point A is in somebody's future? That's something in our model we call the physics domain. It's strictly a physics problem. How the information would get from India being generated tomorrow, how does it get from there then to here now? That is a big and a very challenging question. Uh, the short answer to that is we're not sure, but we have some physics speculations that frankly are at this stage untestable, but uh, at least they don't violate the rules of physics. And so the, sh the real answer to the question, how does the inf where does the information reside and how does it get here, is really fundamentally unknown at this stage, but it does get there. Once we solve the problem of how the information gets, say, from the future to the present or from here now uh, across a room, once we solve that problem, I think it may uh, uh, inform physics about other aspects of time which has so far been uh, not well understood. Um, there is an interesting question uh, that's been posing science fiction writers forever, and that is, if you can see the future, are you condemned to experience that future you've just seen? And that's you know, science fiction people love that because the answer in the science fiction world is no. But we've conducted experiments to test that very idea. And the good news is, if you have a psychic dream that you're going to hit, get hit by a truck on the way to work tomorrow, stay in bed. You can avoid that future. And that is through many, many years of research looking at that very question. And what I find amazing as a researcher is that somebody, our government, U.S. government, was willing to pay me to look at the most pressing f philosophical questions facing humanity for a long period of time. But does this implicate that the future is already determined in some way? The, um, there's an American neuroscientist that uh, informed one of, on one of his talks, said the three most important words in all of science are, I don't know. And the answer about, there are lots of speculation about what the future is. Nobody actually knows. And we have examined, instead of into the microstructure of uh, equations and what have you about uh, how the future is built, because no one really knows the answer to that either, is we say, okay, there's some real practical ways of looking at this. If I'm going to flip a coin uh, five minutes from now, that is a future. And there are two possible outcomes of that future. Either the coin will land heads or it'll land tails. But we can manipulate the future and say, okay, I'm going to flip a bias coin. Instead of 50-50 landing heads and 50% landing tails, I'll make it 75-25. Then the question is, what happens if I flip that coin and it lands the 25% type and you guess the 75%. Do you, do people see actualized futures, futures that actually happen, or futures that are most likely to happen but don't? The answer to that interesting question is, people look at most probable futures even though they don't actually happen. And that's a direct measurement in the laboratory. Okay. Now, what about so-called psychokinesis? In traditional extrasensory perception work, uh, they really have three ways of gathering information. Clairvoyance, telepathy, clairvoyance meaning gathering information uh, just from across the room from an object. Telepathy means gathering information from someone else's mind and precognition looking into the future. Well, there's a fourth topic that's been around for a long, long time in that. Can mind influence matter? 
And on our project with the U.S. government, uh, the missile agencies, missile intelligence agencies, were very, very interested to know if it were possible to divert, divert an incoming Soviet missile during the Cold War off its path. So we had a rather vigorous effort looking to see whether psychokinesis, as it's called, um, could you use that to affect the real world. Uh, you can't prove a negative and say it's impossible, but all I can say is we had, without, with an awful lot of effort, we have no evidence that support that that's possible yet. Okay. Um, but you mentioned that uh, you actually now have contact or have had contact with your uh, Russian uh, colleagues, uh, so to speak. Uh, are the Russians uh, as heavily uh, into these uh, studies as, as we are in the West? There are lots of countries that are interested in this. Uh, in Europe, we have uh, uh, the U UK, uh, some work going on in France and, and what have you. The Russians were very interested in this, oddly enough, because it appears to violate the Communist Manifesto in some regards. Uh, they had a very vigorous action during the Cold War uh, re uh, in terms of programs. For example, um, there's something called a psychotronic generator. This is a, a physical device that psychics could charge up in some way, and it's non-lethal weaponry. It would cause, uh, say, the President of the United States or the, the, the Prime Minister of the UK to not be as effective as a negotiator as it would otherwise be. I was told by the deputy director of KGB, uh, the second in command of the KGB before they shut down the KGB, that they had 40 research institutes across the Soviet Union with large sums of money working with these things. And he sort of sheepish, sheepishly said to me, Ed, we couldn't make it work. And I said, General, had it worked, you guys would have won the Cold War and we had a good belly laugh over the whole thing. So I don't think they uh, were as effect any more effective at psychokinesis than they were. On the other hand, they had 120 remote viewers working that kind of problem. Now, what was the mission or the main purpose of the Stargate program? The whole mission for the Stargate program, which is the name of the U.S. government's program to use psychics for spying, uh, the whole purpose of that program was to use ESP to spy on the Soviet Union and China and East, other, uh, and East Bloc countries. Research was a secondary aspect of it. And apparently it worked because we had 19 different federal agencies in the U.S. government give us various spying missions. Uh, include the Secret Service, even the FBI, the CIA, of course, Defense Intelligence Agency, uh, Joint, Cha uh, Joint Task Force, and so on. A whole lot, 19 different agencies giving spying missions. Over the years, we had 504 separate spying missions. It took uh, nearly 3,000 individual remote viewing sessions to meet the requirements of these spying missions. And what's really interesting, out of this 19, 17 of them came back for, with more spying missions. And that tells me it was working, because if it wasn't working, why would they come back for more? That's amazing. But it surprises me that you can be so open about this. I mean, spying is, uh, used to be a very secret type of activity. Uh, I've been very straightforward with you about, with regard, I've been very straightforward with regard to all the spying missions. The reason I'm capable of doing just that is the CIA released 89,000 pages of project records in between the years of 2002 and 2000, uh, 2000, the year 2003. And so all the material that I've just told you has been released by the CIA. And if they don't care, I'm not going to care. But where is this going to take us? Uh, how is this going to develop and, and, and what will we be able to use it for in the future, in your opinion? One thing I've been asked a lot, uh, is the US government or the Soviet government, Russian government, are they still using this? I hope so, because it would be very useful in this age of terrorism. It probably wouldn't tell you where the next terrorist attack would be, but if there is attack, it might help with other techniques to locate the people who perpetrated the attack in the first place. 
Uh, I spent an, an entire decade with colleagues after the close of the U.S. government's program uh, trying to reinitiate it very beneath the radar so no one would find out about what we were doing. And for sociological reasons, I think more than anything, they said no. Uh, what was interesting is that, uh, and even with regard to uh, counterterrorism, they said no. The workaday people said yes, because it's inexpensive and not dangerous, but it was killed in sort of the military boardroom, if you will, after that. The Russians had the same problem. Uh, I can tell you a brief story, tell a brief story, that um, General Alexei Yurovich Savin, who ran their remote viewing program spying on us, um, my last, one of my la later contacts with him, he was still in the military, and he said, I know you're going to write a, an intelligence report having met me, and you want to know what my organization is? Here it is, my complete organization. And you have my complete permission to take as many pictures as you want, interview me, whatever you want. I want a joint counterterrorism activity using psychics with Americans and us. I said, oh, Alexei, I'd be happy to do that. And I wrote up a 40-page detailed account of that encounter with this general and handed it to his counterpart in the Defense Intelligence Agency. In fact, the director of the intelligence, uh, D Defense Intelligence Agency. And he said, thank you very much. And I walked out the door and you could practically hear him tossing my document into the wastebasket. Nothing happened. Too bad. <laughs> but do you think, uh, apart from that, that this is going to <clears throat> be a major um, field that, that one will pour more resources into developing? I am on the board of a worldwide organization called the Parapsychological Association. It's a member of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. It's a very serious group of people internationally that are, are spending time doing the best science we know how. Uh, there are examples in science where eventually things come to a natural end and they go on the shelf for a while and then rediscovered. My bet is that is what's going to happen here because it's a real phenomenon. Uh, as time go on, goes on, people get more excited about it and learn about it. Uh, we are in the process of archiving uh, for the public uh, four large books, uh, six, seven hundred pages each, of uh, 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 U.S. letter size, eight and a half by eleven inches tall, double columns, an immense amount of work, 1.4 million words. Uh, describing what we did for all those 23 years. That will go on library shelves for archival purposes. And sometime in the future, I'm very confident, someone's going to say, oh, what's this? Oh my goodness, this will teach us about physics and time and pick it up again. At least I hope so. Have you uh, ever experienced any psychic abilities yourself? Not that I'm aware of. Uh, in other words, uh, one model that we have, I think Jon mentioned it, called decision augmentation. I'm very, very successful as an experimenter, and it sounds like bragging, but it's true. I'm very, very successful in life. And my bet is that anybody who has a long series of success for a long period of life are making slightly wiser decisions. I can tell you a little story about that. In the 70s in New York City, it was common to have uh, team building exercises by business because uh, they want to know who should be in the management chain and who should be the next CEO and so on. And a guy named Douglas Dean uh, decided to uh, cooperate with some of these people and in, put into a weekend long of other exams an ESP test. But he wouldn't tell anybody it was an ESP test and you wouldn't know it by the way he designed it. When it was all over, he would tell people, oh, by the way, it was an ESP test, and do you believe in ESP? And what came out of that is just absolutely brilliant, that the salaries of the executives correlated with their scores on the ESP test. The, the more salary they got, the more ESP they had, but they didn't believe in ESP at all. So I think it's, you know, it's a genuine phenomenon. And if you're making decisions, whether business or military or any other kind of decision, why would you ignore that part of the decision of the information game? And the answer is you don't. I mean, we have this word uh, gut feeling. Yeah, that's good. Uh, Some, you know, borderline and intuition. Who the hell knows what mm, that mm, is? Mm. Uh, so it's interesting stuff. Yeah, it is. This was 
Absolutely great. Thank you so much. My pleasure.